Welcome to another installment in the Clock Tower. I'm Pastor Chris uh, Byers of St. John's Lutheran Church, Clock Church. Uh, so glad to be here as we uh, go through this uh, study here. Uh, this is our, our replay, kind of going through what we went through with the adult study for those that were not able to join us in the morning at church, uh, just to kind of keep you connected and also go a little deeper than what we have. So even some that attended the study may also enjoy watching this since we always have only just a limited time to be able to cover a lot of material uh, that uh, we go through. This week is an interesting lesson uh, as we're, we're studying on here uh, in our Bible study that uh, we're doing through Sola, their seed, uh, which is in line where also our kids uh, in Sunday school learn the same. And the seed study is Jacob tricks his father. So it's a really interesting part of scripture, kind of an interesting account and a time uh, which some may find problematic as we uh, look ahead on this. Um, so let's open up uh, before we start this study here, and we'll open with the opening prayer uh, that you can find if you uh, uploaded the uh, or downloaded the uh, worksheet uh, that is on the link that's right above this video as it was up there. Uh, you can always open that up and be able to follow along with what's going on. If you don't have a printer or you prefer having things printed, uh, if you email us at the at the email address, you'll see at clockchurch uh, at plbb.us. Uh, uh, US. Uh, you can ask for it there or just give us a call at the church office. Uh, you can go to the Clock Church also website and get that information there. Uh, that's on the right right underneath, right next to me over there. There. Okay. There. <laughs> All right. I got it figured out here. Right there. Uh, so um, that way you'll be able to uh, get the information you need. We're glad to have you with us here. But let us pray. Eternal God. You call us to be faithful in your in our relationship with you and in our dealings with others. Teach us to be honest and fair, trusting that we are yours and you give us all we need for each day, including your holy presence with us. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The introduction of this goes, the brothers Jacob and Esau were two very different young men. Um, and I'm going to use that term loosely, I guess. Uh, old Isaac favored his rough son Esau, but Rebekah favored her clever son Jacob. Though Esau was the elder, God had foretold that Jacob would be the one through whom his promise would be fulfilled. Uh, so I'm going to go and I'm going to move to my Logos uh, here, and I, that way we can read along with... Uh, with this reading together. I'll also urge you, if you have your own Bible, uh, make sure if you have that there, um, you can pull that out and be able to go through the study also that way uh, and read through the scripture. It's always good to do that. You might be able to make some little notes in your Bible if you like to do that, uh, things that uh, come up. Uh, and I'd also urge you, as we are doing this study, if there are things that come to your mind in the midst of it all that aren't covered, uh, what I talk about, you can always uh, continue on the discussion in the chat area that uh, will be in there and uh, look forward to that. And uh, you may have some insights to offer that nobody else has thought of. So feel free to do that. Uh, be respectful of others in the group, but uh, definitely, uh, definitely feel free to engage because uh, that's where we tend to grow in the faith when we're engaged with one another. So we start out with the 27th chapter, the first verse, and it goes, When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food, that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats, so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. 
Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother. And his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went in to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near, that I may feel you, my son, and know whether you really, that, that you, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac his father who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, Esau's brother came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall, earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of, my, of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, 
flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while, until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him, then I will send and bring you from from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? Well, so that was a long reading. Uh, so on reading these verses, what are some of your initial impress- impressions and questions? What stands out to you? Some of the things that really stood out uh, in the group as we were going through this this morning were deceitfulness of Rebecca, or the deceitfulness of Rebecca and Jacob. Um, yeah, it was quite deceitful what they did. Rebecca was deceiving her own husband uh, as Jacob was deceiving his father at the request, right, of Rebecca. Uh, and then the jealousy and the favoritism that was shown in this, the jealousy of, of each of the brothers against one another and the favoritism shown by each of them, by each of their parent. Uh, it, it is striking when you look at this story, uh, this account here of what we find between these two brothers uh, as it was set up. One thing is the biblical context that is given here in this reading is the first five books, I'll read through this quick, is uh, they are known as the Pentateuch. Uh, Jewish people call this section the Torah, meaning teaching or instruction. These books use stories to teach history and morals. For example, this story shows where the name Israel came from. Jacob and his brother Esau are the third generation in the biblical period of ancestors. They were the rival twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah. The, the Bible is honest in its description of Jacob as a shrewd and clever manipulator. Some might even call him a liar and a thief. But even through this weak and shady guy, God worked to fulfill his promise. Jacob became the father of 12 tribes. It is from him that we get the name Israelites, which literally means the children, sons of Israel. Now, one of the things that we find uh, talking about young men is we kind of have a, a a little bit of a different understanding of this uh, section of scripture um, because uh, our context is is sometimes a little bit off um, because of the assumptions we make we we assume that that uh, Jacob and I and Esau are, are very young at this point still they're you know very young men um, but tradition would argue that that might be a little bit a little bit off there as we think about aging and things like that we have to remember uh, that uh, time that, that people lived a lot longer and uh, I, I like the insight that I received from Luther uh, as he's studying on this here and he says this chapter deals with the amazing transfer of the blessing of the primogenitor from Esau to Jacob and describes the divine judgment which has so far been concealed but is finally disclosed above all of our one must note the computation of the time in order that we may know in what year this event took place um, so you know we really want to look and try uh, going through the chronology chronology of these things and Luther was very strong on chronology. He wanted to try and make sure that the timelines were clear uh, in Scripture. I know we live in an age we often don't think in this way. But by by uh, by Luther's own computations, he would have looked at it and seeing at the time frame there, as you're looking at a, a, an age of, of, of Isaac would be about uh, 137 was the years that he would figure. Um, so... Let's see. Uh, So I'm going to kind of go back over here to the Lagos here. And it says, for at this time, Esau and Jacob were 77. That was the age that he would say Esau and Jacob. So if you're going to say 77 young men, I guess it it all depends on context, right? Uh, If you live to be 137 years old, uh, you're a little younger than uh, 77 isn't as old as uh, we would see it today. I don't think too many of us in these in this day and age would say 77 would be a young age. Um, uh, But uh, here we go, because Jacob goes to Mesopotamia at the age of 77. About this, there is no doubt the computation demonstrates it clearly. Now, we don't know exactly if these are the exact numbers, but you know we're we're looking at uh i would i would look at some of the older bible scholars of this age uh they 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 spent a lot more time going through this cuz it, it was important uh today we maybe don't put as much of importance on that but thinking about that there's a lot of life lived if you think about it in that context uh there was you know esau was not a young man had a lot of children probably had grandchildren in a big household 
We knew he had two wives. He took on two Hittite women, much to the displeasure of his parents. Uh, and and we also uh, see uh, so many different things that are going on. Um, you know, the first question we look at the discussion, we discussed this, was uh, whose idea was it to trick Isaac, which everybody agrees was Rebecca. Rebecca is the one who was the main, uh, uh, the, the main one to instigate this, and she's the main planner. Uh, she's the one who plotted the lie. Uh, she's very clever, as is, uh, as is Jacob, really. Uh, Jacob is very clever, I guess, in many ways, in that sense he takes over after his mother. Um, but uh, why do you think Jacob went along with his plan if he knew it was wrong? See, we know that Jacob, he was worried that, you know, hell, if, uh, if, if dad recognizes that I'm not Esau and I'm trying to fool him, you know, I have smooth skin. <laughs> I, I'm much different than my brother. You know, uh, and if he finds that I'm just, making fun of him i'm mocking him he could curse me uh, and quite literally he he could and he would i deservedly so um but uh rebecca is saying just do this it, it's not she didn't say please son uh follow my discretion she said you listen to my obey me listen to the command of what i'm giving you and follow the directions i'm setting before you so here, here we have some clear guidance, some clear direction that's being given by Rebecca to her son. So in many ways, you th- you look at is Jacob as being a good son in the sense with his mother, who he has probably divided consciences, you know, uh, as it seems. One, he, he knows his father already has issue with him. He's not the favored one for his father's eyes. Uh, mother is he's a mama's boy Um, but uh, so he's going to listen he's obedient to his mother but it's not unwise obedience he's listening to his mom and saying and her and his mom says if he curses you i take the curse on myself Uh, she's going to do that so there's some protection so we we listen and it moves on and we think with this uh, disobedience uh, on there uh, or this obedience on the side as which is if you compare it to Esau there's some disobedience in Esau Esau really if you ask yourself this question studying the going further into Esau Esau was one that was centered on his own comfort i kind of this was brought up in the in the time together here Esau's comfort uh is is very evident in in this here um you know, one, he so easily gives up his birthright uh, over for a bowl of soup, uh, lentil stew. Uh, he, he, he's something that'll temporarily fill his belly. He gives up his birthright, which is not only for him, but his generations to follow. This is his kid's blessing that he's also giving, a birthright he's giving up. This is supposed to go to his, as his, as his major inheritance. And he gives it up for a bowl of soup. He's going to get hungry again. And he, he, he is a, he's not incapable of making food for himself. Uh, we know that about him. Uh, we can also assume, you know, he buried these two other women. He had many children, I'm sure. He uh, had a big household, but his, his parents were not before him marrying Hittite women right? Uh, that they, they did not believe in the one true God. Uh, and there was some great disrespect that was shown there. See, Esau was more focused on his own comfort. See, Jacob didn't marry anyone. Uh, he was less focused on his own comfort as he was serving with his mother and his father, uh, though he wasn't getting the favor from his father, but he, he was getting the favor from his mother. So, Isaac goes in, or Jacob goes in, and he disguises himself. So the next discussion question, what did Jacob do to disguise himself as Esau? According to verse 22, and what did Isaac notice that was strange? What fooled him? Well, we know he disguised himself. Uh, Rebecca was very wise, uh, so she used the goat skin and puts it on his hands and his neck. So he's all of a sudden now very hairy. I kind of got to think, uh, if Esau, if, if this would make him think it was Esau. Esau had to have been a very hairy man uh, for goat skin to fool his father. But uh, And he threw on, and she gave put on Esau's clothing, his best clothing, uh, his fine clothing, the stuff that he was probably wore as a sign of his lordship over the property and things at the time. Uh, so uh, Isaac noticed the voice was different. 
but then he felt the hands and smelled him and it affirmed what he wanted to know uh, uh, he didn't he didn't allow the hearing now one could say well maybe since his eyes were going dim he was going blind he could not see very well possibly his hearing wasn't uh, as good uh, that was one uh, one question or one statement that was brought up and uh, you know that is addressed uh, Luther speaks to that and others address that but it doesn't say uh, I address it this way uh, it doesn't say that he's he's having any issue with his hearing Um Luther would argue on this as I was doing my study on this. It was quite interesting to read. And Luther would argue that it was maybe that uh, was more that uh, he might have been fooled because he so wanted to bless his son. He wanted to get that blessing out. He was willing to forego. Others would, you could also argue, he also puts out there the probability or the possibility of the Holy Spirit helping to ease that because because of the prophecy that had been given at when uh, the boys were in the womb still. So when we think about that prophecy, and we'll go through that, it's on the uh, uh, Genesis 25, verses 20, verse 23. When you read that, you go, here, let me pull that up really quick, and we can, we can take a peek at, at that one verse here. And this was the prophecy spoken by the Lord when she inquired to the Lord. And, uh, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a heavy cloak. So they called him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So we're sitting here. Uh, that's where he gets the computations of ages as Luther looks at the ages. We know he was 60 years old. And then he goes further down and talks about his time in Mesopotamia, uh, Jacob's time in Mesopotamia, and says, and he comp- and computes that he was 77 when he went to Mesopotamia. Uh, so that is where he also computes that Esau would have been, or, or as Isaac would have been, 137 at the time here. Um, but, um, but we know that, uh, you know, Isaac was much, was a much older father also. Um, so it's not like today. I don't know about having my first, having twins at, uh, at 60. Oh God, help me. I pray not. Um, but if God were to bless me that way, I would celebrate it. But, oh my, oh my, at 60, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping my child has twins. And is, is married, and they have twins. Uh, bless me that way. Uh, but I digress. So um, so when we think about that is when Isaac blessed Jacob, what did he pray that God would do for his son? And uh, how did this fulfill what God said about the boys in Genesis 25, 23, when they were born? Well, in this blessing, God gave him the kingdom, right? He said he wanted the, the dew of the fields, the wine uh, to be overflowing, all of the meat, and, and, he, and all would serve him. Nations would bow to his knee, bow to him. Um, you know, we, we read that, and we see that what he is being blessed is the kingdom, right? Uh, that um, that what, what Jacob is offering his son, he says, I want you to be the king. I want you to rule over all of my kingdom, right? And see, Isaac was meant to be a king in some ways, right? In the sense that he is the one that was chosen by God for the people of God. Uh, they had no king in that time, but see, the one who is chosen in their in their eyes, he's the Lord of the land. He's the one who has been blessed. He's the one from whom the promise is to come. Uh, we know that Isaac has quite a bit of holdings because God has blessed him very well. Uh, and what Isaac was praying over his son is you hand over every blessing that you have given me, Lord, to my son, my the one whom I am offering this blessing to. And this is where we find that the fulfillment of the promise that or what was put into that promise that Rebecca was given and you and you know that Rebecca would have shared this with Isaac saying this is what God has said is going on and this is what is going to happen with my twins. 
Isaac was being a little less faithful in this, choosing the firstborn in spite of knowing these words. Uh, it's probably also part of the reason why Rebecca had a, a greater affinity to Jacob, uh, because Jacob was the one of blessing, the one whom God had offered this blessing to. Uh, so you can you can fight in the midst of that, but and it is a great struggle. I mean, one is there is some great deceit that is put out there, but we also see here the blessing being fulfilled that the older shall serve the younger, that Esau would not be the heir, in essence. And Esau was probably, you know, as we said, I stated earlier, because he married the Hittite women, uh, it can be easily argued that he was not as faithful as his brother was. Uh, he honestly wasn't sticking to the, uh, the plan, so to speak. He was for the comfort. It was easy to find a Hittite woman uh, to be his wife because there they were they were a plenty on there. So we move on, and we find in the thirty ninth verse uh, when it talks about well, how did Esau feel when he discovered that his brother had stolen his blessing, and and we read in verses thirty nine and forty the curse that basically was put on him. Uh, I don't know that Esau really fully understood what it meant, uh, what, how important this blessing was, kind of like his birthright. He. His birthright really wasn't of great value other than it belonged to him. And once he gave it up, he despised it. But it really wasn't of great value to him for the moment. It was something he, he was kind of short-sighted. It's kind of like a lot of times if you have a child that wants to save money for that great thing in the future and you give them money and then you go to the store and you give them the ability to save or spend a lot of children will spend that money because they they see the only the short goal in front of them you know oh well i want this now and and it's hard and it's a lesson that's important to teach but it's hard to teach with kids and it's hard to teach even with adults uh that you know that uh if you want that you may have to wait so you can get it otherwise because if you spend the money now it's gone but if you really, really want this bigger thing, then you're going to have to say no to a lot of other things along the path. And that's a hard lesson for a lot of us to learn. It's one that I, I still have to work through myself. It's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like, uh, you know, uh, it's not the easiest way to, to do things, but it's the right way. And it's a good lesson for, for all of us to continually to work through in our lives. Um, but what we, so so we, we see that Esau, I don't, he's screaming out, as he says on here in the 39th and 40th verses there, you know, listening, he says, 39th, he goes, or actually just prior to that, Esau said to his father, have you but one blessing, my father? Well, we know the answer is yes, right? Bless me even also, my fa oh, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. He was sad, of course, but he, he, I don't, he didn't, it just, those words to me ring as a hollow understanding is, what does Esau believe a blessing was? Uh, and uh, why? But, uh, it's, let's see, I'm going to read the notes here. I've made him Lord over you. Jacob's blessing includes the three hierarchies, the domestic, the royal, and the priestly. For the purpose of administering these three, he also gives him the goods of the world. In the state, he has the rule and government among the people. In the church, he has the stewardship of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. This was from uh, Luther's works uh, 55. I can show that to you here in the notes here. Um, at 5 155 as as you go through and understand the blessing that Isaac had given him uh, he was he was uh, he was given a greater power the Hebrew term used broadly for family members the Shemites may refer to Israel's conquest during the time of Joshua's conquest or the monarchy um, so all his brothers so he would have the power over everybody um, uh, and uh 
and that and that was the great blessing. Um, but we also know that there was a great curse that came to that. Just as Cain and Ishmael were estranged from the land of their family, so also Esau would live in Edom, away from the more prosperous Israel region. And that's where we see the fulfillment here is behold away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be and away from the dew of heaven on high by your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother but when you grow restless you shall break his yoke from your neck see god god doesn't uh uh you know god 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 had him bound in this time and the difficulty uh, of, of what of what he's facing is realizing that now he's under his brother's rule. He has no land or anything that could be his because in that blessing that that Isaac gave to Jacob, that that Esau knew what his father was going to give to him, but God had already promised it to Jacob. So really, it wasn't Isaac's to give to Esau, and it never truly belonged to Esau. But because Esau believed it was his, he hated his brother. He, he still thinks he had ownership of the birthright because his brother tricked him. It was like, well, his brother didn't trick him. His brother used, his, used him, his own brother's desires against himself. I mean, Jacob used Esau and his, his impatience against him. He didn't want to wait for blessing. He didn't want to wait to receive his birthright. He was, I'm hungry now. I'm going to die. I could starve to death. He wasn't, I mean, honestly, he wouldn't starve. But if you listen to him, that was the immaturity of his mind at the time. And he gave it up. And the same would be true as he thought he earned, he had held this blessing. And yeah, it was snuck away from him in a way. But it really should never, Isaac, if Isaac was, excuse me, was faithful to what God's, what, what God had put into Rebecca and listened to his wife, uh, he never would have offered it to Esau anyway. But it brought hatred between him and his brothers. Now, the next thing, uh, and, and that's, that's kind of where, how did Esau feel about this? And what did Isaac tell Esau his life would be like? Well, it's going to be a harder life. The story shows the, the, the next one would be, the story shows the power of words. How can words be either harmful or helpful? Have you ever spoken words that you wished you could take back? Why is this not always possible? Well, here we see the power of words. This, is, these, this blessing cannot be taken back once it's given. Uh, and, uh, and, and they can be helpful in lifting another up. They can be hurtful in causing other pains. I mean, we, if we're not building people up we, and, and if we're only tearing people down, you know, that old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, we know is a lie because, uh, honestly, some of the scars that words can create in people's lives are, uh, it's, it creates wounds that, uh, Though bones will mend and heal, uh, words uh, can create a eeping, soothing, oozing wound that never really gets filled in and can turn people into ugly, ugly things and cause people to do even uglier things. We need to be careful of our words because we cannot take them back once they're spoken. It's sort of like the old saying, once, you spray, once the spring is sprung, you can't unspring it. Once the bell is rung, you can't unring it. It's the reality is, is when we say it, it's out there. And I know there's been times I know I have said things that I wish I hadn't. And it's sometimes people offer forgiveness and sometimes people hold grudges. And it's just, it's harder to take a, it's harder to try and bring renewal uh, in any way, especially if people are holding a grudge because of something that you said that's really hard. And sometimes it's just not possible. Sometimes people will not want to forgive you. And sometimes just the words that you say, they have such a weight to them that there is no way to turn them back, uh, that you cannot fix. Um, you know, if, you, if, you're, if your words bring pain or death to another, sometimes they just can't be fixed uh, and it can't be undone. Um, but we pray. Now, to go on the hard side of this, though, is... Thankfully, we have our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
that when we say the wrong things or do the wrong things, because we will and we're sinful and we're broken and we're falling and all that, all of that, we're not. We're going to make mistakes. But see, God, God forgives in spite of those errors, in spite of the mistakes. He forgives, and He forgives fully, and He will not turn His back on you. He will not walk away from you. He will not be ashamed in the sense. He won't say, oh, I'm so ashamed of you. I am not. I don't want anything to do with you. Uh, he, When your heart turns to him and says, Lord, forgive me, there is forgiveness. It won't always fix every relationship out there, but you can find renewal and, uh, and, and you can be forgiven. Now, of course, if you do wrong and you, you feel you hurt someone, apologize to them if they forgive you uh, that's up to that's on them but give to them that thing you know say i'm i apologize please forgive me if they don't offer forgiveness then that is on them and i and please for those that uh that feel like uh they they want to they want it to be over and they want to offer forgiveness when somebody asks for your forgiveness please don't say oh that's okay it's not. It never is. It's not okay. Please say these words. I forgive you. Or you are forgiven. We need to know that we are forgiven. And we need to know what we've done It has been forgiven. We don't have to carry it with us anymore. Uh, we can ultimately offer it up to God and know that he forgives us of everything. And these words come from God directly. Whenever you confess something to God, these words are for you. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. So know that, but also realize, let's be thoughtful of our words, especially in this day and age. I wish people would follow the gold rule of thumb that grandmothers used to say and mothers used to say, if you, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. If we did that, our world would be a lot quieter <laughs> and would be a lot more peaceful. Uh, but that's just a good rule that we can take forward for us here. So now the next one here is think about the Ten Commandments. In this story, what commandments was Jacob breaking? Who was Jacob sinning against? Well, we could look at it ultimately and say, okay, yeah, um, Jacob and Rebecca. Uh, J- Rebecca was not being faithful in her uh, to her husband because she was doing as a seat. So we have bearing false witness, bearing false witness. So we have the eighth commandment there. We also have a covetous nature. If you want to look at it that way, uh, because Rebecca was covetous for her son. So, uh, and as was, and with that, Jacob was also uh, wanting to take something that Isaac was offering to another Esau. Um, So, There was a covetous nature there. So you can look at the ninth and the 10th commandments on that. Then you can look at the stealing. Jacob was stealing um, the blessing. Uh, He he really did steal it. In all reality, we cannot deny that uh, because it was was something that Isaac was giving to Esau and Jacob was taking from Esau. Now we could get into a great debate on whether or not um, and then Jacob, you could argue on that he uh, was dishonoring his father. Um, he was honoring his mother, but dishonoring his father um, because uh, he he was lying uh, and being deceptive. Um, but there's there's some great difficulty as we get into the depths of this here, because uh, it's not a great it's not a great example. But I do want to point to this this I think that. Um, Luther um, really covers this well, and I'm going to read this here because it's something that we can live with, uh, live and use in our thinking in how we should govern ourselves as Christians. If the government tolerates me when I teach the word, I hold it in honor and regard it with all respect as my superior. But if it says, deny God, cast the word aside, then I no longer acknowledge it as the government. In the same way, one must render obedience to one's parents. But if they say, I want you to become a monk or a priest devoted to papal idolatry, then one should by no means obey it. For this is what Moses says in Deuteronomy 33, 9. 
who said of his father and mother, I regard them not. He disowned his brothers and ignored his children, for they observed thy word. God wants us to, ne- to deny ourselves and our life in the second table, if it is contrary to the first. But if they are in agreement, then reverence for the parents is reverence for God. If, on the other hand, they conflict with each other, then an exception is necessary. But is it proper and necessary to state that the government, parents, and every authority must be obeyed? It is proper. I acquiesce in the rule. Then why do you not observe the rule if either the government or your parents demand that you follow their religion? I answer, this is an exception. The first table must be given precedence over the second table. If parents prescribe or command something contrary to God, then the fourth commandment, which previously was valid and unalterable, is abrogated. For in the first commandment it is stated that one must love and honor God above all things. And Acts 5.29 says we must obey God rather than men. All right. So what does that all say? Well, when we think of the Ten Commandments, we have two tables. The first table is the first three commandments. You shall, honor your, uh, you, shall, uh, you shall have no other gods before you. The second commandment is you shall not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the third commandment, you shall honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That is the first table. Those are all focused and directed on God. The second table, it begins with you shall honor your father and your mother. Then you have you shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not uh, covet, you, know, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, manservant, maidservant, anything that belongs to your neighbor. So you have your ten commandments there. Your, so you have the ninth and the tenth are the coveting ones. Those are the thought crimes. Those are if you're thinking that you, if somebody else has something and you think that's great and you desire it, then you should then you should be careful because then your heart is covetous and you are breaking God's law. Um, So, but the first table is where we get our first guidance. The first table is focused on our relationship with God. So we are to have no other gods before us. Now, if we were to look at this truth tale here, when we're, when we're looking at the reality of the situation historically, Rebecca had received word and I've said this before, Rebecca had received word in, 20, in Genesis 25, verse 23, uh, a, a vision God had let her know, a prophecy about her children, that Jacob, the younger, would be over the brother, the stronger, and that was how it was meant to be, and that's how it should stand. So here you have to ask yourself the question, who is being most faithful to God? And that would argument would fall, and we'd have to say, well, that would have to be Jacob and Rebekah. It's really tough in our world now, because I would say in, in a relationship, this is not the best way to do it. Honestly, in many ways, had Rebekah came to her husband quietly and said, this is what God said to me. We need to be faithful to the word and we need to be faithful to God and had she then and he had rejected her completely again and again and if she would have prayed to God and God would have come to her uh, come to him and shown him you know there there was something that would have been but see God had but was at work in the midst of these imperfect people because she wasn't not being a good wife in the sense that uh, she was working in a deceptive way against her husband. And Jacob was not being a good son or a brother because he was working deceptively against his father and against his brother. Uh, and they were working against one another. But ultimately, ultimately, we, we can find that God was still working in spite of their brokenness. And God's plan was being fulfilled and ultimately, we know that plan was fulfilled through Jacob and his line all the way to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So we, Jesus of Nazareth, he is our Messiah. He is the chosen one. He is the one who died on the cross for our sins to save us. And that's where we can see what God's doing and how he uses imperfect people to do this. Uh, even though they were being faithful to God's word imperfectly, right? 
because we know that Rebecca and Rebecca was being faithful to what God had told her imperfectly. She wasn't, she didn't have the strong enough character to stand up and speak to her husband in private, uh, to still honor him, but to allow, but, but to allow God's word to be fulfilled through him. She abrogated that to herself and took it upon herself. Now, do we know the conversations that happened between her and Isaac? No, we don't. Um, so there was some other dynamics in that relationship that we're not fully aware of, but that God doesn't, we don't need to be. Um, that's for God to, to know, and that's where God works. Um, no way biblically would this be the best way to have any type of relationship, though. Uh, it's, it's not a, okay to lie just for the sake of, you know, God doesn't say, just lie to those that don't believe, uh, and it's okay. Uh, you know, um, no, we're not, we're not Muslim in that sense that it's okay to lie to an infidel. <laughs> right. Um, it's not okay. It doesn't excuse it, but God still works within it as God continues to work within our imperfect world. Uh, here it suggests that we read, and I'm going to go back to my screen here and I'm going to pull that up. We read Proverbs 12. And I'm going to type that in here. Proverbs 12, 20 through 22. And we'll go through this, and this is a closing area on here. And Proverbs 12, 20 through 22 says, Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but those who plan peace have joy. No ill befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. So, in what way does God use the story of Jacob as a bad example what not to do? And how does this story show that God remains faithful even when we are unfaithful? Well, I did kind of cover this in the last as I was closing out. We were moving forward here. Um, but see... It is a bad example because there are so many lies and deceptions that are being used to be able to get to the right ends, uh, and we are not. We should be Machiavellian in our in our faith. Uh, we should be uh, very truthful, uh, as truthful as we can. Uh, you know, the ends don't justify the means, is what I mean by that. That's the Machiavellian understanding that the ends justify the means. So, as long as the good still comes out of it, you can say it's okay. No, that's not what I'm saying, and that's not what we should believe or follow as Christians. Um, but we also know that in spite of sin, God will do good. Uh, he, his good will still stand firm. He will, he will still work. It's not necessarily, uh, necessarily our our being either good or bad isn't necessarily going to stop a blessing from coming. If God is desiring to do something through us, He will do it through us, even though we may be imperfect in how we act and how we treat one another. So. Now, ultimately, as Christians, though, that means it doesn't mean we should say, hey, it doesn't matter what I do. As long as I'm faithful, God's going to still make it happen. Now, we shouldn't be trying to do things contrary to what God desires for us. That's not what I'm saying. And that's, I hope you don't, under, you don't understand it that way. But what I'm saying is, even though we are imperfect and broken and we may not do everything as God initially plans, God can still use us. So we don't have to be perfect in our living. We don't have to be perfect in what we do in every way, shape, or form or how we live our lives because God can still use us as broken and imperfect people. And we shouldn't just all of a sudden give up because we find that we continually fail or we fall short. By no means is that what I'm saying, Is that, and I don't want anybody to ever feel that way. But in the end, let us be faithful in how we live our lives and not necessarily look at what Jacob does and says, you know, this is great. Um, we, we want to be truthful in our living, 
We want to be upright and honest in how we do things. We want to be faithful to God first and foremost. We want to be we want to be good citizens in how we live our lives. That means we don't we you know kind of with everything going on in our world, we don't act poorly against others with whom we have disagreement. We act faithfully and we stand firm in what God has put in our hearts and we live out that witness in every action and everything that we do and in how we react and how we treat others. Ultimately, that is, I hope, the thing that we can come out of this. And this is a really interesting part of Scripture. And we, we should find hope in it, saying, hey, if God can use Jacob, if God can use Isaac, if God can use Rebecca, then God can definitely use me. I'd even say he uses Esau. And if that, we can find that, that if God can use these imperfect and broken people, he can definitely use me. And there we can find hope. And may that hope renew you in our hearts. Now, I hope you've had a, you've found this to be quite fascinating and interesting. And I hope you've been commenting and uh, you've been putting things out there. And I hope some discussions go. Feel free to share this with anyone. Uh, you can always go to our website at clockchurch.org. Uh, find out what's going on. Uh, share this video with anybody you know. Uh, that you think might benefit from being able to partake in this study uh, and working through this with one another, uh, feel free to, uh, to, to let me know if there's anything I can help you with, uh, and I'll be there. I thank you for this. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I look forward until next week uh, when we can come together and be in the Word of God together. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we entrust all things to you, knowing you are a great and glorious God. Continue to pour your spirit upon us and your church. Use us as a beacon of light to all those who need to know you. And let us continue to grow in the faith. In your name, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you at Christ Over Coffee on Tuesday.